I do personally think there is not one truth. There's just many, many truths. And whatever serves us in whatever stage of our journey, I welcome. And that might change, you know. It's when we try and force what we believe to be the only way for everyone where it's just it's what's gotten us into this mess right welcome to the angels and awakening podcast where we connect you with your angels loved ones and soul self i'm your host and author julie jancis my journey began when i started hearing my late father before i knew he'd passed Through my readings, membership, and Angel Reiki School, I help you awaken, heal, and master your unique spiritual gifts. If you feel called to work with me, it's your angels guiding you to discover your soul's highest purpose. Details at theangelmedium.com. Thank you, Earth Angels, for the five-star reviews. You're entered into a drawing to win a free session. Now let's see what messages your angels have for you today. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And friends, today we're here with soul sister, Mm -hmm. Rebecca Campbell. She has a new book out. It's called Your Soul Had a Dream, Your Life Is It, How to Be Held by Life When It Feels Like Everything is Falling Apart. I can't tell you how much this title speaks to me. It's amazing. Rebecca, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, I just got a copy sent to me. It's like an early release copy. So it's all very new. (laughs) Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, tell everybody just kind of, actually, I'm going to start a different way. I've never started a podcast this way, but I keep getting a vision of you maybe like leading us into just some healing or prayer or just visualization to just kind of center us into this space today. Totally. So if everyone just places their feet on the ground and just check where your energy is at, are you leaning forward or back, bringing yourself to center and then breathing out any, any energy where we're trying to like grab or get something or resist back, just bringing yourself into that beautiful centered space, imagining a sacred egg all around you. Beautiful and connecting in with source above imagining a pillar of that light coming in through the crown of your head and with your breath allowing yourself to receive and yeah really be filled filled up by this energy so you're self-sourcing and then dropping roots down into the sacred waters of the earth and drinking in whatever qualities that you're yearning for right now to So you're receiving from heaven and earth now. And using your breath to create space around you, really creating this sacred space around you. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I want to dive into your new book, but I think it's in Rise, Sister, Rise that you talk about stepping into becoming a healer yourself and Mm -hmm. that it wasn't always an easy journey. It wasn't easy for you to learn how to use your voice. And I wondered if you could kind of talk to everybody about that because there's so many people who listen to this show who are healers themselves who are called to really use their voice, but that can be a a very challenging and scary journey. And Mm. not all people know how to navigate that. Mm. Well, yeah, 100%. And I think not everyone has that challenge, but I definitely have. and, and, And I think a lot of us do. And I think there are many multifaceted reasons for that. It could, of course, be past lives, but also ancestral. I think that so many of us come from traditions, ancestral traditions, where if you track back because of the stage of history that we're living in, we've been severed from them. And and for some of us, our own ancestors have severed other wisdom traditions. And I think that we're, we are in the process of returning to them. But as we do that, a lot of fear can come up because there's been so so much persecution done in the name of people's beliefs and all of that. And so I think that we are returning in this 
phase that we're in to remembering that the sacred is all around us. It's, it's of course above us in the heavens, but it's also below us in the earth in the plants, the trees, the flowers, and, and of course within us. And I think for so long we have as a species, particularly in the West seen ourselves as separate from nature, separate from the angels, separate from God. The goddess went underground. It it, it was for, forbidden to see the earth as sacred and holy, ourselves as sacred and holy. And so we're in the process of 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 mending that and and reweaving that. And I think at different stages of our journey, the tools that we need, things that that are there to serve us are different at all different stages. And it's not to say that one's right or wrong, good or bad. We're living in such a time of polarity and division and, you know, things are, are seen as right or wrong, good and bad. And this is all part of the human experience. And I think that what we are in the process of doing through returning to our inner wisdom, through gathering the courage to share our truth as our truth, not the truth. <laughs> I think little by little, we're healing that and mending that. I was talking to Eben Alexander. I had him on the podcast yesterday and he has come on before, but he was talking about his near-death experience and crossing through to the other side and seeing different levels of angels. And I said, I've got my idea of why there's different levels and choirs of angels, but what did you see there? And he said something so powerful that there are different angels for different times in our lives when we need different things. Mm -hmm. And that the deeper that we go in our own personal spiritual journey, we need different angels to come in because different things nourish our soul to your point before at different times. How do you work with the angels? Have you ever mm -hmm. had experiences directly with the angels and what were those like? Well, I've got a couple of answers to that. First of all, <laughs> early on in my spiritual journey, the angels were like <laughs> the gateway mm -hmm. in the sense of more in the sense of like learning about them and discovering angel cards and reading angel books and connecting to the angels. But when I look back, particularly as I progressed on my journey. And I was talking to my friend, Kyle Gray, whose work is very heavily into the angels. I had said to him, I always doubted my path with the angels because the way I experienced them seemed to be very different to how they were depicted and how even at that stage, how Kyle was talking about them and other people were talking about them. And so I was like, oh, I mustn't be connecting to the angels. But we were just talking kind of recently and the way he sees angels has actually changed. And at first he started doubting because of that. And he's like, I started seeing them as beings of light rather than just like, like kind of in form. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've seen, like, that's how I've seen it my whole life. And I doubt it. And I think this is, this is why it's like this thing that we're going through now. It's like, it's, it's about your, I'm a mystic. It's about the personal experience, the, the intimate experience of the divine. And, and it's going to appear to each of us. There might be echoes, but it's not like it's this black and white thing, this right and wrong thing. It's how we personally experience them. And so for me, I now know that I've experienced them my whole life. I've seen these beings of light. And when I say that, I'm not necessarily saying it's like this physical external thing right in front of me. It can be a felt sense, a, a knowing or in meditation. It doesn't it, like the inner vision rather than this outer vision. And I think this kind of like way of talking about them where I know that like some people actually have these very real experiences and I've had many mystical experiences myself, but I don't expect everyone to have experienced their mystical experience in the same way. And so for me, they come as more like collective beings rather than individual. That's where my main work has been with them. So you grew up Catholic, right? And I did too. And one of the things that I've just found hard is there's so much that you kind of get this is bad. I still have people in my family who's like, this is of the devil. You should really stop mm. doing this work. And I, I'm like, it's just love. I have done over mm. 7,000 sessions and it's just love. I've never connected with a hell. It's just beings in heaven that you still connect with heart to heart and that love still exists and that relationship can still exist. I know that some people talk about angels in different ways and that there's councils like galactic councils on the other side. I've never allowed myself to go in 
and explore those because it just feels like, I don't know, like I just stay with the angels because it's what's familiar to me and it's what feels good. Did you have anything like that as a Catholic and how did you Mm. break free? I'm not religious anymore, spiritual, Mm. but how did you break out of that and allow yourself to kind of go deeper into your own journey? Oh, yeah, that's a big question, isn't it? I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic girls school. But from a family point of view, we just went to church at Easter and Christmas. So it wasn't too harshly pushed upon me. So I didn't have the weight that I know a lot of other people do. I I understand it. And I've seen it. I think this question of, yeah, the kind of, and 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 I see it come up so much, like particularly around like new age, that kind of thing as like, oh, it's like, oh, it's spirit guides and angels and all of that. You need to know who you're connecting with and all of that. And I don't disagree with that to a point because it's just like when you go out walking on the street, you know, like yeah. you're going to you're going to look left and right before you cross the road. And I think the same exists in the subtle realms as the physical realms. And so it's why intention is so important. And so I think it is important to know that if you are wanting to work energetically with spirit. You go in with clear intention and like you said, the intention to connect in, like I will be like, I am calling upon my spirit guides only of the highest realm. You know, you have your thing that you say before you connect in with the subtle realms, just like, you know, you look left and right before you cross a road. So I think that that is important. And I think a lot of people who are going into the spiritual discovery phase Mm -hmm. maybe aren't really doing that. So I think there, there is a little bit of a like, yeah, we, we should learn to cross the road, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But I don't see it as evil or demonic yeah. or bad yeah. in that sense. And I think this minefield of, I don't even want to say just Christianity, but, you know, religion, which is more doctrine versus spirituality, where the crossover exists. Oh my goodness. It's so complicated because mm-hmm. like for me, what I got from being raised Catholic is the practice of prayer. Mm -hmm. connecting with Christ, connecting with Mary, particularly Mary. And that has only ever deepened. And obviously we know with everything that has happened with the feminine being written out of the Bible, Mary Magdalene, Mm -hmm. and more and more and more, but we can still feel that presence there. And so it's just, it's the perfect storm of where we are in our society, right? Because I'm a big, uh, I have great respect for anyone who's on any kind of faith path. I do personally think there is not one truth, there's just many, many truths. And whatever serves us in whatever stage of our journey, I welcome. And that might change, you know, it's when we try and force what we believe to be the only way for everyone where it's just, it's what's gotten us into this mess, right? Absolutely. A billion percent. I love that. And I prayed like, because I love your work. You just, you see Rebecca Campbell, if you don't follow her on Instagram, you should, because you just feel this energy of love exuding from your heart. And I felt in prayer that I could ask you anything and go deeper Mm -hmm. into my own spiritual journey. So I just thank you for sharing from your heart. Here's our free and paid upcoming events. Angel Reiki School is in person November 8th through 10th in Chicagoland or begin online November 1st. My new course, Release Fear and Embrace Miracles starts November 1st online. Become a member to get this course free or it's $133 for non-members. We have a free workshop October 23rd at 8 p.m. Central on how fear is really holding you back. And join our free prayer meeting right before that at 7 p.m. Central. Sign up for all of this and more at theangelmedium.com backslash events. I love the name, your soul had a dream and your life is it. Explain that. Explain how you kind of came up with it. Explain the new book a little bit so that we can go into Mm. it deeper. 
that phrase came to me many years ago and I remember sharing it with the head of Hay House and he was like, that's your next book title. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Meanwhile, I'd been writing a book whose title had changed over and over and over again. And this new book, which is Your Soul Had a Dream, Your Life Is It, it began with a mystical experience I had in 2017 where I was in the middle of my kirtan yoga teacher training, which kirtan is to sing the name of the divine. So it's devotional chanting, essentially. And I went into this spontaneous trance state, this mystical experience where my consciousness was transported to the center of the earth into the arms of the great mother goddess. And I saw the gates of life, souls entering from the left with the inhale of the breath and leaving on the right with the exhale, vast cosmos above and ancient grandmothers of the earth. So ancient grandmothers being like our connection all the way back to the original mother singing all the souls in, in the primordial waters of the earth, which I liken to like where we all came from, the biological Mm -hmm. waters of the mother. And I saw the journey of the soul, the dream that our soul had to be here now in this body at this time, in our ancestral line, on this planet, what a time that is. That's really what that title means. The book is about rebirth. It's about dark nights of the soul as well, because I think collectively we are going through a period of time, which is that. I don't think that the earth needs us to survive, but we certainly need her if we're going to stay here as a species. And so this really is this interesting time that I believe we have chosen to incarnate here for. And we each hold a thread for the healing of humanity. And I know it's an overwhelming time to be here as well, an exciting time and an overwhelming time with everything that is happening in all corners of the world, from ecocide to genocide to us waking up to the unconscious ways of how humanity has been treating each other and the earth. And there is this mass awakening happening at the same time. So the book holds a lot. <laughs> and yeah, I needed I needed a poetic title for it to be able to hold it all. Well, one of the things I love about your books is they're not all like your typical books of these long, long chapters that you have to get through. I like that there's just short bites. And I think at some of the beginnings of your books, you say you could read just one page a day, or you can mm. read like all the way through, which kind of gives you freedom as a reader to just do whatever you have time for in the moment, which is freeing to a lot of us women. But Mm. when it comes to this, do you remember having this dream of your life or do we all just get remembrances through our intuition and we're following that one breadcrumb at a time throughout Mm. our journey? I think we tend to come in not remembering, but part of us, I think, always does. And particularly as children, we're way more open. Like my mum said that I would say to her, I came here for a reason. You just wait. When I grow up, you'll see. (laughs) And I had this like urgency around growing up and I knew I needed to create things, but I didn't know what it was. And I had visions along the way as well. But I I did have an experience, which I, I wrote about in my first book, Light is a New Black, where I had a past life regression. I was just interested in the Akashic Records and past lives. I was beginning to study them myself. And so I went to my friend's friend was doing past life regressions in Singapore and she booked me in to go see her and she was regressing me and I wasn't even sure if it was working at first and then I kind of was like observing me answering and I'm like oh my god something is really happening here and I experienced a couple of past lives but the most significant thing that happened which is really where this book came from as well The Light is the New Black which was the first book I wrote was I was regressed to the space in between lives. So the moment before this life, and if anyone has the Starseed Oracle, there's a card in there, I think it's called I Remember, that depicts the visual that I saw. And I saw myself looking through a pool of water, which now having been a mum twice, I, I think that's like the womb water. So maybe it was like my mum was pregnant and my soul was deciding whether or not to come. I didn't get that water connection until much later. And this is the thing about mystical experiences, awakening experiences. 
we can go into them and they can continue to teach us and transmit to us over and over and over again, over decades. Anyway, and so I saw through the waters, I felt a presence of, you could say guides, you could say angel. I'm not sure. There was definitely one, a being of light. There was definitely a a wise elder presence. And so I think some people would call that a guardian angel. I didn't hear that as that's what they were, but it was definitely a a light being who was there for my consult, for my guidance. And it was as if my soul was like, here's all the stuff I need to do, or, you know, here's who I am and here it's da da da. And I, and I looked through the waters and I remember seeing three different options for places of incarnation and fam, like ancestral line families of mothers, mother, father, you know, that kind of thing. And one of which was the family that I ended up choosing who my biological family. So I experienced that. And then I was taken to a separate place place with other souls. So that that first experience was as if, and it all happened in the same experience, was me receiving what I would call my personal soul mission. So like, you know, what I'm here to do on a soul level, just like for my own soul's growth. Then we went elsewhere and there's a whole group of souls gathering. And I, and, and I, I, I wrote about this in Light is a New Black. And we were gathered with, it was like all this like excitement, anticipation. And then I was introduced to a consciousness called the Council of Light. And they came in and essentially gave us or transmitted to us our joint mission. So I would say that that's like, you know, there's a group of souls. And I think there was like thousands and thousands and thousands. It wasn't like a select few, maybe even more. Maybe it's all of us who are here now. I don't know. And we received a collective mission together. So I work with the seraphim angels a lot. And it's so interesting because when some people, and I haven't dived deep into it, but some people call them councils or this or that. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of the, like the beings that you're talking about as the seraphim. I want to tie in a couple of points because they say, and you talk about this in the book that about 2012, 2011, things really shifted here. And that's Mm. where the seraphim say that they started to come in more palpably. Of course, they were working more before, but there was just something that shifted energetically here that allowed them to come in more. But the seraphim say that souls on the other side don't all come through for the same reason. Some are tapped Mm. and asked to come in because their vibration is needed here and only they can do something, but it's not just one person. Like you're saying, Mm. it's a big collective of people coming in at the same time in different places. Some people raise their hand on the other side. And I think that there are some people over in heaven, having like a big family party Mm. and their kids are like, I think mom, we're going to go back for another lifetime. (laughs) And you're like, no, (laughs) I don't want to come back in. It's hard, but that there's some souls who come back to support you know, Mm -hmm. the ones that they're coming through with. I see you as working so much with the seraphim also because the seraphim talk about beauty differently. They say Mm -hmm. beauty isn't what we think that it is. You have this wonderful aesthetic. And if anybody knows your cards, you change the game for all intuitive cards where everybody kind of now replicates your aesthetic Mm. for the front and and of your books. I feel like that is very ingrained in your energy of the beauty holds an energy itself. How do you think about that? And how would you describe it? Because beauty is so much Mm. different energetically than what people think it is. Thank you. Yes, 100%. Beauty is harmony. I've written a chapter on this in the new book, which is, I forget the chapter's name, but it's something like the difference between beauty and perfection or pretty even. Because I think people think when they think of beauty, they think of perfection or something being pretty, you know, but beauty is not just pretty, but it's in harmony. Mm -hmm. So let me give an example the rose, which I would say most people would say it's one of the most beautiful things on this planet. They say vibrationally as well, the rose is absolute harmony. You know, it's divine perfection. But when we think of the rose, we are thinking of the rose in full bloom, most of us. But I think what makes the rose beautiful is that 
it is not in a constant state of perfection. There is a moment that it's reaching towards of the full bloom, but the bud is beautiful. The rose hip is beautiful. Whereas if we were talking about prettiness, it would be just that moment, you know, Mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks when it is in full bloom. And so I think beauty is harmony. Beauty is embracing truth as well. Aesthetic beauty versus aesthetic like perfection (laughs) is I do think like in all of my work, I'm constantly refining, refining, refining. And it's like I'm working energetically as I do that, like to get the clarity to that point. Or like before I teach, I find it really hard if I'm not able to get into the room to start with. I can do it, but it's so much better if I can be in the room and you'll just see me pottering around. (laughs) I'm just like moving things slightly. I might be spraying some sprays. I might be placing a couple of cards around, lighting some sacred smoke. Like I'm just kind of shifting the energy until it feels like everything's in harmony. Mm -hmm. To me, that is what the beauty way is. It's subtly different from, but, and I think the way we, it's, if the beauty is feminine, I I would say more so than masculine, not saying the masculine is not beautiful. Every person who identifies as male has the feminine in them too. I think that where we've got our, relationship with beauty off and wrong is with the containing of the feminine Mm -hmm. and objectifying of the feminine. And so as a woman myself, like there is this pressure to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to be a certain age even. Like when I was younger, I was trying to be older. When I'm older, I'm trying to be younger. And it's more so than men. And I think that this is when we look at like woman, I think woman is trying to be pretty. When we're trying to go against where we are, that's not beauty. It's not beauty because because beauty lasts. Don't you love it? Sometimes I think I'm in meditation and I think to myself, oh my gosh, you couldn't be in a better profession where you get to become and unfold into the Mm. white, long-haired, wise woman. And it's accepted within spirituality. I got this vision too while you were speaking of first unfolding that you have to see the beauty not just in the end picture or the end results, but in the every moment. And so is beauty also tied in with presence? You have to be really Mm. present to feel that harmony and to tune into that energy of beauty. Yeah, I totally agree. Because I guess presence is truth as well, observing truth. And in my mystery school, we do this practice of, first of all, recognizing that a mystical experience, What? how we enter a mystical experience is to enter into a state of awe. That's the quickest way. And in nature, it's so easy to do that. And so we do these practices of like looking at a flower, no matter what state, and just breathing with that sunset, sunrise, the dew on the, on the grass, the tree in the wind, that kind of thing. If you actually take a moment with nature and truly be there present with it, you will enter this state of awe. When we're in this state of awe, what happens is we experience the transcendence and imminence at the same time. So we feel connected to absolutely everything because we are connected to everything. We're part of nature ourselves. And you feel insignificant through that connection. And that I think is where we go out of chronological linear time and into Kairos time. And I think this is when we connect to the angels. This is when we connect with spirit. We can feel the the expansion that happens as we connect in, but also zoom out at the same time. I'm sure you've had that experience. I call it oneness. And I think mm. I had, I think I read in your book too. Did you have an experience too where a tree, you just felt the energy of the tree reaching out to you? Because I have this tree that sits right outside of my window. And it's just the most massive tree in my neighbor's yard across the street. And I would sit normally out of this window looking at the tree doing my 
interviews mm. and I just felt it sending me oh. so much love and so much energy. But I do a oneness meditation and I know a lot of people talk about being grounded and rooted. I love when my energy no longer feels like it's completely within my body, but I'm mm. just one with all that is and all that is is one with me. Beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to talk, there's a, a chapter in your new book about grief and you talk about grief a little bit differently than I've ever heard people explain it, where you can really see grief as a vehicle to open up you to more expansiveness. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think grief is evidence of how much we love or loved someone, something. And the invitation for grief is always, how can I let this soften me? Anyone who's experienced proper grief, like, you know, the grief that comes in waves. And I think all of us, if we live with an open heart, it's impossible not to experience grief. We have this feeling of like, you know, it hits us like a wave and there's an actual like aching that happens in the heart, you know? And I think that if we can be like, okay, so Someone said to me just recently the difference between depression and grief, and I loved what they said. They said that grief is alive because it is this evidence of how much we love. It Mm -hmm. is raw. It is just like life force flowing, right? Whereas depression is like we've cut ourselves off. We've shut ourselves down. So I think understanding the difference of those two is, is really, really helpful. And I think that grief can be this doorway for us to awaken our hearts even more. I think that there are different stages of the awakening process. First stage is the ascent, which tends to be awakening of the mind, awakening of the heart and make awakening of the body. And then there can be a, become a descent where we go into the dark nights of the soul and it's like more of our soul is able to come in because of that expansion that has been caused in earlier stages. I think that the awakening of the heart tends to happen and be triggered by grief, heartbreak, heartache. How about you? 100%. And, you know, I love what you said about depression because it's almost as if, and I want to go into that dark night of the soul piece because we just had Thomas Moore on mm-hmm. too. And I love mm-hmm. dark night of the soul. It's just so interesting to explore that piece. But when you're in grief and you feel that vast love, you're still alive, you're still you, and you're still all of your uniqueness and going through your journey as yourself, you're experiencing something hard, but you're carrying yourself with you and you're opening up to a deeper part of yourself. But with that depression, I feel like the world just loves to use the word soul and soul is so delicious and yummy, but there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. And when we cut off our spirit and the things that we love doing and following our intuition, my God, there's a part of us that just starts to wither away. And Mm not become as much of ourselves. And that's not the way that the angels want us to go. It's not the way that Mm -hmm. our soul wants to go. It wants to live. You talk about how life is trying to initiate you. How is life trying to initiate us? Talk Mm -hmm. to people about that. Well, the first thing to realize is that because we're, we are not disconnected from nature. We are part of nature. Nature's always changing. Look at the seasons, look at the rose, look at every part of nature, never meant to stay the same. And we're not either. And so as we go through life's changes, the invitation in the initiation, the initiations are those things that happen to us that feel like they're happening to us right? We're victim to it. They're invitations for us to step into our becoming, to change, to embrace the ever-changing true nature of our being. Friends, I just want to thank you for sharing each episode with your friends. Because of you, we've hit nearly 10 million downloads a year. Wow. As a thank you and gift, please enjoy my free 31 day angel success formula at theangelmedium.com so you can start connecting with your angels today. And please share today's episode if you've enjoyed it and tag me at angel podcast. I love it.
For some people, and I'm sure you see this, some people it feels like it's easier for them to follow their intuition. I don't know if they've been told since they were little to follow the whispers of their heart, to follow the callings of their heart. But for some people, it brings up a lot of anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. How do you help those who carry that anxiety and fear step into following their own hearts and listening to themselves because that's where the dream of our soul really is. Mm. So I think the main thing is to not look at it like it's like there's this one big thing that you need to do. And because I think often like when we we put all this pressure on one big decision, like what is my life purpose or something like that. It's like even if you receive a vision for it, it's complicated to work out how the heck to make it happen. And we are soul and body and mind. It's like we're meant to have all those parts. And so uh, when I studied intuition, the way I was taught was that we have in our society, we've set it up wrong. So we kind of like live the, the way most of us have been taught is to live from the mind. So to control things, to make stuff happen, my personal will. But when we're relying purely on my personal will, we're disconnected from nature because it's just individual, right? Whereas the heart is the first organ to develop and the heart is home of the soul. It's where our intuition resides. Um, my first teacher, Sonia, used to say to me, place your hand on your heart and just say, my heart wants me to know that. And that's a really great way to just begin to hear your intuition. Call it your heart call it, my body wants me to know that because our body is intuitive, by the way, it's through our body senses that we receive our intuition. And the next thing I would say is like, get into some kind of practice where you're connecting in with whatever you call it, whether it's soul, spirit, angels, intuition, some kind of really simple practice, five minutes a day, it doesn't have to be long, where you connect in and develop a relationship with that part of you. And then off the back of it, and I've got this thing, I call it the three steps to living a soul-led life. The first step is connect. Second step is listen. The third step is act. So connect would be like do a meditation, intuitive dance, chanting, whatever. Listen, ask your soul, ask your intuition. What do I need to hear? What am I feeling today? What's the guidance I'm ready to hear today? I would say, what's my soul yearning for or what's my soul calling me to do? And then Step three is grounded action. So how can I act on this? You'd say, cool, I've got this guidance and maybe the guidance is really wishy-washy or it doesn't make sense. You know, like for me, there were years where it was like, write a book or other times where it's just like, you know, welcome more love into my life. Like that's just <laughs> not tangible. It's wishy-washy and and it's pointless. It's If it stays there, it's absolutely pointless. Like unless you embody it, embody it and act on it, there's no point doing it. So then you go, okay, what's a baby step I can take? So for me, if I'm going back to, it was like, write a book, write a book. It would be research, research publishers. That might be my task. Might take me one minute, might take me five minutes or find my three favorite books and work out who publishes them. For example, that would be the baby step for the day. If it was welcome more love in my life, it might just be at the end of today, I'm going to write down three ways that I brought more love into my life or learn to see the love that's here in my daughter's eyes or my son's eyes or my husband's eyes, like say something lovely to them. Really bite size. We got to get into that kind of habit because when we feel like we're disconnected from our intuition, it's it's likely that we're we're living too much from the mind living from the mind is not a bad thing. It's just like, I don't think it should be the number one place that we live from. Absolutely. All right. I want you to ask you about chanting because mm -hmm. it's something that I haven't gotten into yet, but I've experienced it through some other healers and it brings you into such a deeper part of yourself. How did you get into it? What is your view of it and why and how? Does it bring you so much farther, deeper into yourself? Well, chanting is a vibrational meditation practice. So you're using the vibration of your voice to heal, to shift, to connect. Various different traditions, you'll be chanting often sacred 
mantras, which are passed down through the ages that hold a certain vibration. One of my teachers, Guru Nam Singh, he, he said to me that someone taught him that the chants exist within the vibrational field. And these are ancient ones that have existed for, yeah. And so when you chant them, you're effect effectively like tapping into the frequency and the power of all the people who've ever chanted them. So I do believe that is also part of the power and the depth of chanting. I personally believe that there is no sound current that's more powerful than our own voice mm -hmm. and that devotional chanting in particular, it obviously is great for the throat chakra if you have any like issues regarding that, like around trusting your voice, trusting your intuition, speaking your truth, stepping into your power, that kind of thing. Whenever I lead chanting in groups, I always begin by saying the only way you're going to get this wrong is by trying to sound good. Like you just like don't perform. It's about offering the chant to yourself. So it's like as nectar for yourself. And if you do that, you will notice there's a point during a chant where your voice does shift. And so you shift from the performative voice to the soul's voice. And like, I know that I'm talking from my soul when the cadence of my voice slows down, there's a melodicness that comes, the, the depth of my voice, like it deepens. I'm talking from my mind, it's often uh, da, 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 up here like that. And again, it's nothing wrong, but it's just, it's all good information. So, you know, if we are questioning, is that my intuition or is that my head? We've got like imprints in our body to know, be like, oh no, when I talk from my soul, when I say something that feels really true or that is guided, all these are traits that happen. I think I got into chanting partly because I had always been drawn to it, but I never saw myself as doing it in my work. It was always like for myself and did never dreamt of like doing trainings in it or like leading chants or even I record music. It's, it's all on Spotify and iTunes and all of that. Definitely didn't expect that to happen, but I was drawn to it. I think because it touched something in my heart that I had been yearning for, but did not have words for. When I started chanting, the tears just came, but they weren't necessarily tears of grief or sadness. They were tears of like longing for that union, that oneness, that bhakti, the essence, the nectar that I think that our souls remember and yearn for, but can't quite name. And I think as well for me, because sharing my voice being visible and sharing my words and creations. Like I had a lot of fear around that, which I know I'm not alone in that. Chanting really felt like it cleared and healed a lot of the imprints that my soul came in with and perhaps ancestral as well around fear of being seen, fear of stepping into feminine power, fear of owning the wisdom within. If you have a minute more. We tell angel stories and they're just miracle stories, divine intervention, stories where you just know like you know like you know you're being led. Do you have any stories? And I'm mm. sure you've got lots of of them, those mystical experiences. Any one particular one that feels like you want to share? Mm. Yeah, one was really incredible and it was actually the story that initiated my spiritual path. I was a teenager and I was reading a magazine, you know, the magazines that teach you about boys and what's happening to your body and pop stars and stuff. And there was this article about this woman who had lost a child and her child was around my age. And the article was about her grief, I guess, but also like the daughter died of taking the ecstasy tablet, I think it was. And so it was kind of like a very popular topical story of the time. But really what I felt in the story, it was all about the preciousness of life and connection of life and and just tell the people that you love, that you love them, you know. I was really moved by it, like in a way that I'd never experienced before. Like it was literally like, this moment in the timeline of my life where uh, like the second before I hadn't read it and then the second after my life was completely changed. I didn't understand why. Next day at school, I had the magazine and I was showing my friend Jenny. I went to a girl's school, was sitting on the Holy Drive underneath the Mother Mary statue. And it was just like school kids and a couple of teachers. 
And I showed her the article and pointed at the mother. Her name was Angela. I said, it's just, I can't shake this feeling that I I like need to find her and just like hug her. And I just like, I just want to take her grief away. I, I don't understand it. And I didn't understand it. I hadn't known anyone who'd experienced anything big like that. And my friend Jenny was like, that's really weird. Like, that is weird. I know that is weird. But then she's like, oh my God, that lady over there kind of looks like the woman in the in the picture. And it was her. She was there. She was talking to the senior students that day. And long story short, and I, I wrote about this in, I actually dedicated my second book to Angela, but I wrote about this story in my first book. I went to find her and I got in, intercepted by a teacher and was like, oh my God, did I just imagine that? And then I turned around and we both like banged into each other and stood up and like looked at each other. And it was like this soul remembrance. I'd never experienced anything like that before. I've experienced it a couple of times since, but not in the same depth as this. And we ended up becoming really good friends. I would call her Angel, uh, Angela, and I'd like put her a, the A in brackets. And Angels was where we began. We would share books on angels. And she took me to my first events. She took me to, we we did trainings together, like in mystical arts and, and spirituality. And I remember going to my first Hay House event and I can do it in Australia. Again, I was a teenager. I couldn't have gone without someone taking me. So she like literally initiated, well, this experience initiated my spiritual path. Yeah. I remember her leaning over to me and saying, that'll be you up there one day. And so it was a really significant moment, but she, she would call me her angel and it was her birthday that day. And she'd spoken to her daughter who had passed and said, what's my birthday present today? send the angels my way. And it was like our connection was it. So yeah. Oh, that is so beautiful. Rebecca, please tell everybody where they can find you, your new book. Yep. So Your Soul Had a Dream, Your Life Is It is available wherever you can buy books. Um, You can head to rebeccacampbell.me forward slash Your Soul Had a Dream and you'll get like a free event and various music and various other things as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for spending your time here. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Thank thank you, Julie. If you feel called to become a certified angel messenger, energy healer, and medium, join my Angel Reiki school to learn all three at once. I'll also give you my secret sauce for building a successful, sustainable spiritual business. We're in person November 2024 and April 2025, or start the Angel Reiki School online on the first of the month. For personal messages from your spirit team, book a one-on-one reading with me. New slots are released monthly via email. Join my membership to grow spiritually, heal deeply, and connect with your angels for daily guidance and support on your personal journey. Visit theangelmedium.com backslash contact if you'd like to chat about which program would be best for you. Now, take a deep breath, tune into the loving presence of your angels, and ask them, how would you have me be of service? experience joy, and open my heart to abundance today, and let them whisper answers to you all day long. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you back here Thursday with a brand new episode.